direct from Montreal, Canada. This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon on this, the first episode of 2020. And of course, 2020 will be a great year to talk rock. We've got uh, the Motley Crue tour with Def Leppard and Poison and, well, a lot of tours. So I'm not going to enumerate them all here. And oh, yes, yes, there is that tour that's going to be announced this month. It's going to hit sheds all summer long, which features two bands from the 70s, one band from the 80s. And uh, by the way, one of those bands has toured with Def Leppard in the past. So ooh, there's a little hint. So that'll be coming up soon, but I'm going to start 2020 by looking back on one of the most underrated, maybe even forgotten uh, albums of of the 90s. Uh, Unusual Heat by Foreigner it is, of course, the last album to feature bassist Rick Wills and drummer Dennis Elliott from the classic lineup of Head Games, of course. The Well... Listen, they did put out a live album in um, 2019, which which included Rick and and, and Dennis. But overall, it was uh, the last, well, let's, let's call it the last studio album to feature those members. But it also had singer Johnny Edwards. Now, uh, Johnny was known before that for having sang with uh, Montrose, King Cobra. Eventually, he went on and did Wild Horses, which I believe had uh, James Kotak, who, of course, spent many, many years with uh, the Scorpions and, of course, Kingdom Come. And uh, Johnny's back. He's got a new band called Blue Funk, and it's spelled P-H-O-N-Q-U-E, Blue Funk. And uh, they have a Blue Funk album that you can go listen to on Spotify. And, of course, I have new music planned for 2020. And Johnny, to me, is just one of those great, great vocalists who, unfortunately, was at the right place at the wrong time. Uh, To be with a foreigner in 1991 was probably not the best uh, place to be in terms of, you know, melodic rock was coming to an end. The band was moving on without Lou Graham. Uh, you know, we, we were, we were in that sort of grunge, pre-grunge, uh, era where Seattle was, uh, the Seattle sound, for the lack of a better word, was starting to, to rear its ugly head. Yeah, that's right, I said its ugly head, you heard me. Uh, I'm not a fan. Uh, but, but, uh, anyway, listen, if you go back and you take a moment to listen to Unusual Heat. There, there are some great, great moments. And, and by the way, and I talked this to, to, to Johnny about this, there is also a CD single, which is still readily available on eBay and Discogs.com, where uh, Johnny and uh, Mick do a, an acoustic duet or duo of uh, Dirty White Boy. And it's a fun version. It's it's fun to hear Johnny sing one of the classic songs. Cause it's the only place where you're going to find that. I mean, unless you go to YouTube and watch some concert footage. But you look at songs or you listen to songs. I don't know why you'd want to look at a song. Uh, like Dirty um, dirty White Boy. Like uh, Low Down and Dirty. That's a classic Foreigner song. It's, it's as good as anything else. You know, uh, singles I'll Fight For You is a great song. Ready For The Rain. Uh, when the night comes down, moment of truth. There's just a lot of really, really good songs on there. And uh, again, it, it fell through the hole. And and listen, it was the last sort of Head Games classic lineup album by the band. You know, I don't know I'm going to repeat myself, but you have Rick Wills and Dennis Elliott. And I have to say, when I saw the Double Vision show it Mohegan Sun in 2018, which which had Lou Graham and, and the old band coming back. And, and I talked about this in the interview with Lou Graham uh, from a couple of weeks ago. Dennis Elliott, my, my Lord, holy moly, he has become better with, with age. I, I went there uh, at that show at Mohegan Sun to see Foreigner, um, fully expecting uh, Kelly Hansen and Jeff Pilsen to, to come out and deliver the goods. And then I thought, well, okay, let's see what this the, the old band goes, and then we'll we'll hear Lou Graham sing, uh, you know, uh, Blue Morning, and then you hear Dennis Elliott come there and tappity tap tap, and oh, you go, oh, well, look at that, he's the star of this of this little thing, 
I say that respectfully, no disrespect. By the way, a Lou Graham is coming to my neck of the woods on August 14th, 2020. He will be playing at the Franklin County Fair in Malone, New York, which I'm very, very much looking forward to. And truth be told, I helped set that up. I put the fair and lose people together. Yay. Yay for me. Anyway, let us get on to our guest of the day. It is from the band Blue Funk, formerly a foreigner. Here is a singer... Johnny Edwards. We are speaking with the blue funk singer Johnny Edwards, and I know some of you are saying Blue Who? Well, it is a band you need to check <laughs> out, right? It's a band you need to check out. You can check them out uh, on facebook.com slash blue funk p-h-o-n-q-u-e music but of course, some of you might know him better from Buster Brown, King Cobra, and of course Unusual Heat, the great great foreigner album uh bonjour monsieur how are you i'm doing great and bonjour to you monsieur yes uh, <laughs> yes uh, i am up in montreal so we always go with a little uh, bit of the french but all right let, let's you know the 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 fans know you from all those great bands in the 80s and early 90s uh talk to me about what you've been doing since and how do we get into blue funk is this something that you you took some time off and then you said hey you know really like playing or have you sort of always been playing and now you've just gotten to this band at this time no i retired for 20 years <laughs> and uh i'm fortunate that i have skills in other areas and i uh i work in communications doing uh you know computer stuff and, and uh, so i raised a couple of wonderful daughters and and uh, spent 20 years doing that and um then when they've moved on and they're now out on their own doing great it was something that i thought might be fun to do so we started a another little band around here in louisville where i'm from and uh so yeah we've been uh been around here for uh, a couple of years now and playing clubs and doing little shows and just having a great time so let me ask you about about the retirement then 20 years ago was that something where you just said all right I'm not going to be Mick Jagger, so let me just go be a regular guy. Or was it so so fed up with the business where you just went, F this, I, I just can't do this anymore. I'm out. Was it just sort of, <laughs> was it a reality check well, or was it a, 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 you know, I've had enough kind of thing? Yeah, um, well, after Foreigner, I felt I had unfinished business. And so I put another band together in LA called um, Royal Jelly. And we had a deal with Island Records. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. But, I am. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a great project. I really enjoyed that. And I always said, you know, if I could just put an album together that I was really proud of, where I felt I had the most creative input. And um, that turned out to be Royal Jelly. Of course, it, nobody bought it. <laughs> so it wasn't the kind of thing, you know, I could build a long career on. But once I finished that um we went out and toured but it was obvious you know we weren't going to be financially successful in the near term and had a mortgage and a wife and two daughters and it was kind of a thing where you know what this is not appropriate to carry on and and uh, put my family in, in financial hardship to chase this and I was satisfied that I'd done something, you know, that I was really proud of with the Royal jelly and other things too. I'm proud of all the work that I've done, but, um, it was easy for me at that point to transition over and, and, uh, live life as a, as a regular person for 20, 20 years. And then, uh, so now chapter, chapter three, I guess. <laughs> so, and of course, you what, what happened. and now you've got me calling, which is, uh, and of course you were in a band, a couple of bands with uh, James Kotak, who eventually went on to be in uh -huh. the Scorpions and Kingdom Come and all that right. stuff. But, but let me talk oh, to you yeah. about this unusual Heat album. Um, okay. I'm a huge, huge uh, Foreigner fan, obviously, and and I really okay. think that this album is underrated. It, it, it came out in 1991. And it, it just probably was the wrong album at the wrong time for the scene and so on, you know. But you look at Low Down and Dirty. You look at Ready for the Rain. You look at When the Night Comes Down. There's all these great, great songs. Um, 
Talk to me about that that moment when you got into the band, and did you have any trepidation going, hey, I'm, I'm going to replace Lou Graham, which arguably is one of the greatest voices in rock? Oh, yeah, no doubt. And I'd, 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 uh, I'd be a liar if I said I wasn't influenced by him and Paul Rogers and the other, you know, great singers in that style, Steve Marriott. You know, these are the guys that I listened to growing up. And, and so it was... Uh, intimidating of course to jump in there now at the time i had already signed a contract with atlantic with james and uh another great friend from buster brown kevin downs was a bass player in that band and uh tony bowles was a great guitar player from louisville that we had put together a band in la and we had just signed a contract with atlantic called wild horses was the name of that band and and so I was ready to move with that. And then this foreigner thing came up and I was conflicted about it because I, I, I felt like you just said, you know, the timing wasn't right. It seemed like the Seattle sound was coming in and everybody wanted to get back to the root. And um, so, you know, I went out to New York with Nick and we checked it out and he listened to all the music that I had and it just seemed like okay I'd be silly not to not to take the opportunity and so we uh we went down that track but I think you hit the nail on the head it was it was just uh, at a time when corporate rock wasn't really the right track to be on and so then of course <laughs> Promotion wise, it was difficult too because radio was transitioning. You're starting to get into that period that we've been in for 30 years now, where the same classic rock songs are what's still supporting, you know, AOR radio. And so it was really hard to break a new band. We did get some substantial airplay with Low Down and Dirty, but still to uh, break out something new when it was already starting to take shape as the model that we still have today with certain songs uh, from the, you know, the heart of the classic rock era. So, and then of course, sound scan came into being the very week <laughs> that we released that album. So it used to be that, um, you know, a record company could put a lot of buzz out there in advance about a record coming out and they could, they could work the system to where it would appear as a, as a big release. And um, so you could get up high on the billboard charts, just off promotional things that a record company could do. And SoundScan, uh, you're probably familiar with that. It's, it's a way that um, the industry can track the exact sales, not necessarily what shipped to a record store, but what actually went out over the counter. So it became impossible then for record companies to, to promote albums in advance the way they had traditionally. So that worked against us, and we came out, you know, pretty low on the Billboard chart, and and uh, so yeah, it was just a little bit of a tough, tough sell there at that particular moment in time. I, I'm going to ask you just a couple more about Blue Funk, and then I'll get back to Foreigner in a second. Now, now Blue Funk plays around Louisville. Is that something that really is just sort of a pickup band for fun? And because I've seen some of the video you do, like when the levee breaks and you do a bunch of stuff like that, is it just sort of a a fun, hey, let's get together thing? Or do you see yourself trying to get on tour, trying to get a record deal, trying to to make it into a, a brand and a business? Well, I have a I have a nasty habit of, of thinking that way. I don't know why I can't seem to look at any musical endeavor as a as a hobby. That's really what this is. Um and but I you know, we do like to write our own songs and we like to record them and we like to make them better and we we like to do the best shows that we can and we take it pretty seriously um it's a it's a interesting market around here it's mainly a cover band marketplace and um there's some great musicians but there's not much uh to offer in terms of original music so um at this stage of the game, it's hard to pick. You know, I still work, and I will for a while. You know, <laughs> I like to work, and I'm still feeling energetic. So I'm going to keep my job. <laughs> and, uh, 
and so are the other guys in the band. Of course, we all work, but we're all really excited to finally, you know, have an opportunity to get together and write our own music and record it and, and do it. I mean, there's really no difference in the process. Either you're writing the songs the best you can and recording them the best you can, or you're a cover band uh, just having fun. So we've chosen plan A, <laughs> which is to just write the best songs we can and record them as well as we can and present ourselves um, more as a concert style band. Um, when when festivals and things come along, those are the kinds of gigs that we're interested in doing or opportunities that we have to play one set or limited sets where we can do mostly our own stuff. We like to cover songs too uh, and do them our own way as much as we can. Of course, the Zeppelin stuff. <laughs> we're pretty much doing that one like the record, which is a lot of fun. But yeah, that's kind of where we are. Well, good. So so let's hope let's hope it becomes something. Uh, I do want to take you back real quick, uh, quick to King Cobra 3. Uh, mm -hmm. great yeah. record that came Carmine. out, Carmine, great record that came out at the mm -hmm. end of the eighties. There's also a lot of kiss connection to it. Uh, you've got legends never die written by Gene Simmons. And of course, Adam Mitchell, uh, it's my right. life, Simmons and Stanley, Peter Chris is apparently, uh, an additional musician on it. Talk to me about that album and, and trying to sort of establish the band because, you know, here you are in 88, you've got Def Leppard out there, you've got Bon Jovi out there. You've got Metallica out there. You've got Motley Crue out there. You know, an incredible, an incredibly crowded marketplace. Uh, talk to me about trying to find your place in that, and also this lineup because it is a great album, and, and and you do have Carmine, and you have all this Kiss connection, and it's like, wow, this is this this should have been it. Uh, yeah, yeah, and we had a video that got some MTV airplay, but you're right, it was a saturated market for that. 80s you know hairband style now what was behind all that um i moved out to sacramento in 85 because i had some connections to the work that i did with ronnie machos and there was a manager out there who had signed the band tesla to geffen records and he asked me to come out and join up in a band called northrop with a fellow named jeff northrop who you may know and Jeff's a great songwriter, great guitar player. And um, so we we went out there, my wife and I, and we worked with that project for going on three years. And we, man, we must have set the world's record for <laughs> writing songs and sending them out to record companies because we just wrote song after song, demo after demo, and sent them all out. And we were working with songwriters and Carmine was one of those that would come up and work with us. And, um, so we got to know him that way. And he had decided to put, uh, King Cobra back together because they had a couple of albums that they put out on a major label. I'm not sure what label that was. Um, but, um, he had decided to put it back together and release another independent album under the King Cobra name. So he basically asked Northrop if we wanted to be the King Cobra band. So we went in and, and recorded the thing and Carmine played drums on it. And then we went out and did a few shows and a video under the name King Cobra, but it, it wasn't um, really what I would say was a focused effort to put King Cobra on the map. Um, it was kind of a, project that was designed to basically build on the name that was already out there so we uh we were busy with our own thing and we we took that project on but then we went back to northrop and kept doing what we were doing which is what led to me uh ended up in foreigner some of the foreigner demo some of the northrop demos uh are what ended up getting the ear of of mick jones and his, his brother kevin who was in charge of trying to find another singer so they, they heard the demos that I did with Northrop, and uh, that's how they ended up calling me. All right, so let me, let me get you back then real quick to uh, to Unusual Heat. And, and for folks out there, I'm going to tell you this. There is a foreigner single called I'll Fight For You. It's a song from Unusual Heat. Uh, there's a CD single, and the bonus track on it, or the B-side if you want, is Dirty White Boy Live at GLR, which is a thing in Germany. Uh, 
if you don't have it, you should try to track it down online. It's actually easy to find, and the, it's an acoustic version with Johnny singing. It's absolutely fantastic. And and Johnny, I know you, I know you haven't heard it, but I do have this, and I'll send it to you if you want. Uh, it's it, it's okay. it's great. But but okay, so so you so this led to the foreigner stuff. Now, did they did they just did you grab their ear and they went, hey, we like this guy. He's got a certain timber and a certain style, and let's do this. Or was there sort of the, 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 the soup line audition process where you stood there with a number and go, all right, number 87, come on down, let's hear what you... like. What was the process for you to get into the band? Well, they, uh, Dave Felt was an A&R guy at uh, Atlantic Records, and we, we had solicited him heavily with the Northwood demos, and he had tried to sign Northrop to Atlantic Records but couldn't get it all the way through. He was a fan of that band. And when Foreigner started looking for singers, he suggested to them that they listen to some of my record uh, recordings. And uh, they did that, and then they started calling me. By this time, I was already engaged with this Wild Horses thing. And ironically, we had, we were on the verge of signing a contract with Atlantic Records. <laughs> so incestuous. Anyway, uh, so they called me up and said, Hey, you might want to hold off on signing that, you know, Mick's really interested in, in, uh, talking to you about this project. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, these are my friends and I'm really dedicated to this. And I said, you know, thanks, but no thanks. You know, I, I really want to follow this through. And I said, well, okay. And, uh, then about, uh, oh, gosh, a week later, we went ahead and signed this contract with Atlantic. And about a week later, Mick called me up and he said, Hey, Johnny, uh, I'm down here in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, I just came out on the Rolling Stone jet with Jan Winter. I'm just out here for a day. He said, Why don't you come over, you know, just have a cup of coffee? You know, I'm just sitting here at the hotel. And I said, Well, what the heck? I'll go have a cup of coffee with this guy. And uh, so I went down there and he started talking and we got we hit it off a little bit. And then he said, man, look, he said, I'm flying out tonight back to New York. Why don't you go pack a bag and get on this private jet, the Rolling Stone private jet with me and fly back to New York. And let's see, you know, what, what, what happens? I said, well, okay. You know, what harm could it do? So we did that. And, uh, then the next day we went down to a rehearsal room and I sang a few songs with the band and they, they asked me if I would join. So it's funny too. He came out there to, uh, he came out there. I think there were three singers on the short list. One of them was Mark free, who was the singer on the King Cobra demos that I was, that I was asked to sing later on. And, uh, the other was Kelly Hansen, who is the lead singer now. So it's just so funny how things come and go around. It really is. And, and it does go to show that it's a small, small world after all, like Disney always said. And mm-hmm. and you sort of got to, I guess you sort of got to be nice to everybody because you, you've got, uh, you, you've got uh, Mick and, and, and anyway, it's, I, I just, I think that's funny. Uh, in 2017, the band released uh, 40, a compilation of uh, 40 greatest hits going all the way back to 1977. Mm-hmm. And they included Low Down and Dirty and some other stuff. Um, what do you think of that in terms of the respect and the nod that it gives to, to your era? Because it's very easy for Mick Jones and, 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 you know, to take the Lou Graham stuff and the Kelly stuff and just say, eh, let's just pretend that unusual heat never happened. And yet, on this package, they went, no, 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 no. We're going to tip a hat to that era and, and, and give Johnny a spot on this. Um, what, what did you think of that? Yeah. That was kind of cool. I respect huh? that. Uh, yeah, I think it's good. I think it's smart. It certainly doesn't hurt anything. And, uh, you know, I, I'm... I still like to think of myself as friends with everybody, so I think it's, I think it's good. I think it was smart, smart to do that. Uh, and the course. record sounds great. I mean, Terry Thomas producing, my goodness, he he's super talented. So yeah, yeah, that foreigner, that style, well, good. that foreigner forty compilation, they they man, they cleaned up all the tracks. Everything sounds absolutely stunning. Um, 
Talk to me a little bit about Montrose. So here you are with uh, James Kotak. You 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 move out from Louisville. You're playing with the great and the late Monty, uh, Ronnie Montrose. What do you learn from that process? Because he's not doing that 80s L.A. scene. It's not a hair metal thing. It's not, you know, it's a very sort of sophisticated bluesy rock. Talk, talk to me about being with him and what do you learn from being in his band and, of course, and putting out the Mean album. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we got hooked up with Ronnie when, yeah, Buster Brown was touring around the Southeast and Ronnie came through and he was doing shows with his own band. So he had some guys from the Bay Area uh, and they were coming through and they needed, we we were one of those bands, you know, they had this enormous PA and light show and everything and truck and, <laughs> and a great crew that would help set everything up and and uh so the club owners were like hey well here's a band you know they they got all the production and uh you know they can open the show and then uh it'll be kind of consistent you know for a few dates around the southeast so we did that for a couple of weeks we would uh set everything up and open the show and then ronnie would play with his band and then we would pack everything up and drive all night to the next place and start it all over again and so we got to know him and he was, he realized right away that we were all big fans. He's one of the first guys that really hit me over the head, like a ton of lead. That first Montrose album is still one of the greatest albums of all time. And, uh, so we hit it off and, and afterwards we hired him to come in and record a demo for Buster Brown. And he got, to know us a little bit in a studio setting. We did it in a studio down in Nashville. And um, when he decided to go ahead and he kind of did everything in reverse, he went out and toured and had his band and they had some songs and they played them on tour. And then he wanted to record the album after the tour was done. Usually it goes the other way around. But um, then when it came time to record the thing, he asked James and I to come out there. And uh, we just flew out, spent two weeks, learned the songs, recorded the album and came back. And, um, that was it. You know, he put it out. If it would have caught fire, then, um, it probably might've turned out differently. He might've wanted to do more with it, but like a lot of things, timing and, uh, it was self-produced. Ronnie, uh, did it on a pretty low budget and, uh, put it out through Enigma records. And so, yeah, that was the story there. Just wasn't a whole lot of follow-up after we did the record. Which is which is too bad. Now, I will remind folks that uh, Blue Funk, and I'll spell it again, P-H-O-N-Q-U-E, do have an album that has come out in 2018. You can head over to uh, cdbaby.com and just look up Blue Funk. You can get it there. Uh, but uh, just real quick, Johnny, for the fans that haven't heard it, what what kind of music will they get with these 11 tracks? Is, is it sort of... Uh, a rock album is it a, is it a funk album uh, i've had a chance to hear it i think it's great but but for folks who haven't heard it, who want to check it out what can they expect oh it's a rock album no doubt um it's pretty stripped down i mean there's like one guitar track one you know drums and bass and vocals you know the, it's not layered in any way it's a really stripped down uh recording which is the kinds of recordings that I've always loved. Um, so we didn't want to get in there and try to sample things and put a lot of layers of stuff in there and vocal harmonies and things. It's basically us playing live and produced by a great friend of ours, Steve Wilson. Um, so we had a lot of fun doing it. Steve did a great job and we're just uh, out there playing the songs and writing more. We're, going to put out another some kind of product here in the next few months and just keep the cycle going so yeah it's a rock album we do some funky songs um uh, we do some bluesy songs um but yeah it's just guitar bass and drums man well folks should definitely head over to cd baby and, and check that out or wherever else they can get it and uh on that johnny i just want to say thank you you know i've i've been a huge Foreigner fan, and I actually truly, truly love Unusual Heat. I think there's a lot of great stuff on there, and it just 
It just fell through the cracks, and it shouldn't. So hopefully uh, folks will go check that out. And it's just been a pleasure to talk to you because I've interviewed Kelly. I actually interviewed Lou Graham this morning for the third time, and I was just like, you know what? we got to get Johnny on, too. we we, we got to get all three, <laughs> you know? Okay. And so we got it done, and uh, hopefully we can do more. So when the new album comes out, uh, send me a text or whatever, and let's let's do another one. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot more to it to delve into, and... We didn't really get a chance to talk about how Kiss got involved or the how those songs got involved on the King Cobra stuff. I, I'm assuming they're just submitted, and then as Carmine's putting it together, he goes, well, why don't we just try this one? That's probably the process, right? Yeah, yeah. I, and I wasn't that much involved in the organizing of the tracks. They were pretty much chosen, and and we just came in and basically recorded the guitars and the bass and the vocals and Carmine played the drums so most of that stuff was already written and selected by the time we got around to it but But, boy I love Carmine he's he's something else man he's still just so ridiculously good on drums oh he's unbelievable Uh, and and, and it was Mm -hmm. was his birthday earlier this month so there you go okay Uh, on that Uh, sir as we say in Montreal merci Uh, thank you so much merci beaucoup thank you all right. Bonjour. Bonsoir. Yeah, great. Right. Bye. This has been Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. For more exclusive content and interviews, subscribe on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, and many more. Follow Mitch on all the socials, especially Twitter at Mitch LaFon and on Instagram at Mitch underscore LaFon. Get your Mitch merch now at loudtracks.com slash Mitch.